The 2nd of June, 1582, the Genma found another way to return Nobunaga to life, and now he is a way more powerful war leader. A group of freedom fighters under command of Mitsuhide Akechi, an uncle of Samanosuke Akechi, is wearing a signal from Samanosuke to ambush Nobunaga's castle. When everybody is ready, they infiltrate the main gates and face demons. Samanosuke Akechi, being fully equipped from a previous game, is slashing everything that looks different from generic NPC soldier. He enters Nobunaga's private room. Nobody seems to care about the fire all over the place. Maybe it's a part of decorations, because it doesn't make damage to anything. Nobunaga is protected by a head retainer, Ranmaru Mori. As history states, Mori was a lover of Nobunaga due to his feminine beauty. He was also very loyal and stood beside Nobunaga until the very end. He challenged Samanosuke. But isn't worth even a muscle contraction, that's why he falls down quite fast. But Nobunaga turns the tables, shooting projectiles at Samanosuke and holds him down the ground. When it looks like the end for noble Samanosuke Akechi, a black hole opens in the center of the room and teleports him and Ranmaru Mori to an unknown place. The 8th of May 2004. Paris, France. Police officer Jacques Blanc is having a call with his son Henri. They are interrupted by Jacques' comrade, Philippe, who is under attack and asks for backup. Out of the blue, the Genma invaded Paris. They spill blood of any passerby who is unlucky to be outside. French forces can't stand a chance against the creatures. And when Officer Philippe gets injured, Dante, I mean Jean Reno, I mean Jacques Blanc, arrives for a backup. Luckily, he has infinite ammo and no recoil, so he deals with the Genma troops relatively well, until more and more spider demons surround Jacques and his brother-in-arms. After a few minutes of non-stop shooting, Jacques runs out of bullets and sees his whole 10 minutes life flashed before his eyes. He is preparing to spend his savings for the burial process. Fortunately for him, Samanosuke Akechi was teleported to the future to save the world and Jacques Blanc's bank account. Due to linguistic barrier, they do not understand each other. Huh? A samurai? You. Where are we? Mais qui es-tu? Huh? D'où tu viens? and Samanosuke casually walks away, while Philippe and Jacques find themselves inside a time void which sends them back in time to Japan. The time traveling takes much energy and Philippe cannot bear it and dies on Jacques's hands. Walking through the forest, Jacques hears a scream of his son asking for subscribing to my channel and giving a dislike just for a laugh. Screaming in the Capcom forest attracts trouble. And now Henry is in danger because of some kind of a demonic bullfrog slash zero-eyed cyclops stalking him. An underage boy, which is illegal, of course. That's why Jacques's force of habit makes him pull the trigger and shoot a few times at the criminal. It doesn't do any harm and when there are no bullets left, he jumps on the cyclops with his bare hands. Surprise surprise, the demon is not a common child mo- Lester. So it fights back and throwing its one hand is enough to send Jacques flying, almost breaking his bones. In the moment of need, Mr. Blanc gets help from the Oni clan, which grants him the Oni gauntlet and a magical whip. This weapon is a game changer that makes everything better and easier. Beating all the guts out from the Cyclops, it vanishes into thin air, as well as Henri, who was unconscious. In fact, it was Oni clan's final exam to estimate whether Jacques is worthy of saving Japan. By coincidence, the foreigner, as the Oni spirit calls him, was sent back in time 10 days before Samanosuke Akechi attacks Nobunaga Oda at his castle. Samanosuke cannot beat the warlord alone, and Jacques has to help him if he wants to see Henri safe and well. To assist this too, the Oni spirit summons a Tengu, according to a Japanese folklore, a minor spirit who is considered to be a reincarnated spirit of those who were proud and arrogant in life. But in Animusha series, it's a good creature who helps others. Her name is Akko. She can use spells to translate languages from French to Japanese, for example. Or she brings loot from fallen monsters and gives it to the player. Another feature is dresses you can obtain during the game and give it to her to grant additional buffs. She is a girl after all. And the spell she will cast in the end of the game will be a wet dream to once and seek to others. 
Making his way through the forest, Jacques gets help from Semenovsky Akechi from 10 days before the ambush on Nobunaga Oda. At first, they cannot find a common language and a western barbarian is ready to kick ass, but Akko quietens them down. They summarize everything that is going on around and what led to this. Jacques sees no other way but help Semenovsky to fight the Genma to get back in his time. They shake hands, which confuses Semenovsky, and move on. They end up at a Buddhist temple, which is a source of the Genma troops around this place. The temple is under Mori's control, so he gets a chance to get to know the Gaijin. The boy is outnumbered, and he summons this stinky demon clown from the first game. These warriors didn't waste their time and have evolved to wield heavy swords. Mori flees and Samanoski runs after him, leaving Jacques alone to face this, the most beautiful, strongest and bravest warrior among all Nobunaga's army. But flattery doesn't work, it never does, so Jacques dies almost immediately. Thanks to the only clan in case of a grave danger, only warriors can turn into Animusha and kick ass of all ugly bastards who dare to threaten a French gendarme with their compensating swords. However, Jacques is wounded and before he leaves this place, he wants to see his son Henri one last time. Turns out, Akka can travel through time to deliver the message to Henri. To everybody's big surprise, she jumps to the future. Something like this will be popping up when another time period would take place, so nobody would confuse the events, as the locations mostly look alike. Samanoski dreamt about traveling as his uncle insisted on, so here you go. He overachieved his wishes and travels in the future. There in the future, Samanoski he feels at home and steals his first phone. Is this the crusty crab? He cannot use it properly, but look, he is trying. Looking up at the Arc de Triumph, he sees Cyber Guildenstern, the Genma scientist who devoted his life to serving anybody who gives him freedom of experimenting on people for the sake of creating new Genmas. Samanoski knows where he has to go next. His journey is abrupted on a halfway by a blonde commander Michelle. She speaks French, asking Samanoski what cosplay phantom he belongs to. Having the best cosplay costume, he doesn't bother explaining himself, staring right at her soul. She hears her man scream and comes to assist them, but it's too damn late, all her people are lying dead. The cameraman takes an unusual shot, but because of distraction he couldn't warn Michelle of approaching monsters. By sheer luck she is staying alive under attacks until Samanoski comes to enjoy sightseeing. Putting down monsters and saving the lady is a free option in his ticket, so why not? She is alive, but needs to lie down, so her broken spine would recover by itself. Samanoski goes to the top, through the museum. Damn, those museum visitors are so rude. On the roof, Guildenstern is preparing his show for Samanoski. When a guest arrives, Guildenstern kindly explains what happens around, and before he leaves, he introduces his new creation. Metal Gear. After the battle, Samanoski goes down to check on Michelle. She is fine, but doesn't trust him and aims weapon at him. Akka appears before anybody got hurt, and she makes it clear that Jack is safe and can defend himself now. Akka translates languages, and Samanoski gets to know Michelle better. Turns out she is a fiancé of Jacques and worries about him a lot. She gets a distress signal as her division is losing a battle against monsters in the drains. Samanoski does what he is best at, cleaning the world from the Genma. But I am not sure that those boogers are the Genma. Haven't they been here before? Cleaning the drains and saving the forces, Samanoski and Michelle visit another tourist attraction, Notre Dame de Paris. When they come closer, Samanoski's phone rings, and Michelle, thinking it's Jacques, who found a phone boot in 16th century Japan, grabs the phone and answers the call. It's Henri who is waiting for his father, who promised to be home in a few hours. Michelle explains that his father went out to buy cigarettes and got lost. Give a like if your father too should have already bought a whole cigarette warehouse to this moment. Anyway, Michelle has to look after the boy, as she is going to be his stepmother. They can't really find a common language, but Michelle is trying her best. Sadly, this kind of language misunderstanding is beyond Echo's capacity. However, she delivers Jacques' message to Henri to be a good boy, and not to worry about his father, as he has got magical powers and is going to establish law and order in Japan. Akko's mission in the future is completed, so she jumps back in time. Mmm, that's a 10. 
they need to help Samanoski, who is fighting that Brad Murray. Before going outside, they hear a noise from the crate nearby. There is a watch inside it and some future stuff. At the same time, Samanoski comes back safe and sound. He says that stamp on the chest is from Sakai City, a port town that trades with the West. There is the merchant they need and Jacques shows him the watch, but he insists on seeing it for the first time in his life. Jacques, being a liar savvy, doesn't buy his crap and being kicked away, comes up with a plan. He sneaks into his place again and listens to a conversation of the merchant's apprentice. This scumbag does a business with the Genma and they have prepared some things to sell, because soon the monster's ship will arrive. When those two leave the place, Jacques looks around for clues and finds a scroll about Jubei Yagyu, who is hiding after his attack on Nobunaga. He was chased by ninjas, but nobody was successful enough to put an end to this guy. Rumors say that he has been seen with Oichi riding a ship to the west. That's cute. And there is another scroll which tells a story of Takichira Kinoshita, who was last seen jumping off from the Oni ship after losing the battle with Jubei. Takichira changed his name to Hashiba Hideyoshi after successfully leading Genma army through Japan while Nobunaga was absent. When the warlord returned, his trust in Hashiba increased tenfold and he sent him in his army to suppress western lands. Not cute. Jacques goes outside and sees how the Genma do business. Turns out they don't need money and eager to collect as many dead bodies as they can. In the repository nearby, Jacques finds Samanoski and a stack of western goods from the future. Sadly, it's useless for about 200 years. At the docks, they see a gorgeous motorbike. While they're going over, somebody calls them. This guy is Tadakatsu Heihachiro Honda, who works for Nobunaga Oda. He challenged Samanoski, but Jacques, as a real man, helps his brother in arms to beat up the weirdo. He may be strange, yet he bought some time so the ship sails off far enough that nobody can reach it. Meanwhile, Henry from the future feels that his father needs help. He takes the keys from the bike and tries to hand it over. That's when Aka jumps in and picks it up, wondering how Henry knew this. The boy doesn't have the answer, yet he feels the strong connection. Jacques starts the bike and rides to the ramp to reach the ship. The speed is not enough, but he uses the whip and grabs tough rails. Turns out the western ship represents a flying Dutchman, which goes under the water. Aka thinks it's going to the Genma hideout. Jacques has nothing to do but just patiently wait, while Aka is going to the future to thank Henri. She puts everybody into the picture. It's clear, so far they've made zero progress, while Jacques is doing all the dirty work. Samanovsky has no idea what to do next, but thanks to Gildenstern's kindness, he calls the samurai and tells where to go now, to the Notre Dame de Paris basement, where low of good old Genma are being created right now. You see, it's an enormous tomb where lies a vast source of souls which might be resurrected and used against enemies. You know, I've been fighting the same zombie Genmas for the last three games. It's lame they didn't put in place brand new human creatures of Paris to make the battle goddamn varied. So, Samanoski finds a present Gildenstern has prepared. I'll give you time, guess what it is. Alright, time's up. The portal that sends you to the Genma hideout. <laughs> <laughs> so simple. Jacques will destroy the demons from the past and Samanoski from the future with the help of Gildenstern alone. Ladies and gentle chats, I introduce you the smartest scientist and probably a winner of the next Ig Nobel Prize. He even uncovers all the witty plans of Nobunaga and what's more, leaves priceless books about how the time machine works. Gildenstern activates the portal and goes into it. After putting down the obstacles, Samanoski does the same and finds himself inside a once abandoned Oni hideout. There is also a faded hundred years old ship where Jacques was or is vibing in the past. Speaking about him, Akko wants to check on the lonely gendarme, but she cannot travel in time inside the Oni walls and they go on looking for Gildenstern. In the main operating room, they find an interactable statue with four dragons on it and a device that allows Akko to jump in time, so she does. In the past, Jacques is at the same place and now they need to cooperate between times to ruin all the plans. Nobody said it would be easy. While Mori is guarding the schemes in the past, sending Elite Genma over Jacques's head, in the future he is transformed into a half Genma creature. At first, I cannot comprehend how to fight such a swift warrior. So I'm holding my guard and waiting for the Morris raw moves to make a blow. He admits his defeat and confesses that his body is still fighting the morbid transformation. Being a man of honor, Samanoski doesn't finish him off. Maybe letting Mori redeem his name from the stain. The boy doesn't learn the lesson and limps off. 
In the past, Jacques encounters the spear guy Mr. Honda. I have no idea why, but he is fighting the Genma. And Jacques asks for answers, but Honda just walks away laughing, leaving more questions. I thought he might be another boss, aka source of souls, but instead, the detective faces the two-faced guard dog, like Cerberus, on a low budget. I tell you, Animusha and Devil May Cry teams in Capcom were coping one another's beats. Unfortunately, the battle doesn't require much strategy or brain at all. I monotonously avoid his attack using the magical flies in the air and strike when the time is right. Nothing to leave an impression. The dog was guarding the Genma train that heads straight to the castle where the time machine is being under development. Jacques gets on it and when dust settles down, he experiences emotional damage missing his son. But not Michelle. He didn't say anything about her so far. Aka convinces him that the both Samanoski and him are fighting for the future of loved ones. So he has to keep fighting. Jacques comes down and decides to take a well-deserved rest while Aka would check on Samanoski. He was waiting in the control room and seeing Aka is back, they head to the room where Jacques was fighting the Cerberus. In the future, the place is under command of one-headed dog, Mori. He is doing what he is best at playing a decoy to lure Samanoski into a trap. He believes Samanoski has never experienced that before. <laughs> Stuck in a magical circle with no escape. This time the Genma boy promises that anybody who would be sucked into this trap would be turned in the Genma. Please, yes, yes. The trap sends him somewhere and Henry, having a strong bond with Oni members, feels unease over Samanoski. He can idle no more and runs yeah. away from Michelle's watch. That doesn't look good. So Michelle runs after him, but he vanishes immediately. She is sure he stepped inside the church. And she is right. Henry is there. But the Genma are blocking her way. This time I can experience how would a heavily armed human survive the Genma invasion. Generally, it's an easy stroll and to make matters better, she has infinite ammo and a quick firing shotgun with no reload. Piece of cake I've thought until I met these guys. They parry any shot and it's almost impossible to put them down if you don't have grenades. Or it's just me who couldn't find their weak spots. When they are done, Michelle sees Akko, who is saying that Henry and Samanoski are both held in cages in the local zoo. Indeed, they are hostages to be transformed into the Genma. But you know, if I were Guildenstern, I would put maximum effort into transforming Samanoski first, as he is the biggest threat to the master plan. But Guildenstern takes his time and probably uses all the blessings of the future civilization. Skateboarding, drinking water from a toilet bowl, taking a mortgage or enjoying games like Half-Life 2 and San Andreas. What a splendid life. In the zoo, Samanoski tells and promises Henri everything will be alright and Michelle will save them. This time they understand each other without Aka being around. Samanoski is learning languages with flying colors. Michelle puts the hammer down, breaking all limits, clearly seeing the the face of Dominique Taretta on her windscreen, who invites her in the family. At the zoo, Guildenstern lets free new types of the Genma. Very annoying and sturdy, consequences of mixing a monkey's body, elephant's heart and blood of the Genma. That's not what I've asked for when talked about new enemies from local surroundings. Michelle and Aka take a ride on cruise boat, and they have a chat about Henri's attitude towards a new stepmother. A few years ago, Henri's mother died in a car accident, protecting him. He blames himself for that since then. Michelle feels that Henri is either not ready or doesn't want a new mom. The zoo is already occupied and decorated in the best traditions of the Genma, tasteless and ugly. They have established a museum of losers where placed paintings of demon leaders who were slain. For instance, Giga Fat Butts and Fortinbra. Michelle opens cages and frees Samanoski and Henri. The boy seeing his savior happily runs yeah. towards Michelle, and usually slow motion is a bad sign. This one is not an exception. Copying his tricks from the first game, Guildenstern appears from nothing and takes the family members away. Samanoski served his time and now has to get back to society. Yes, his life will never be the same, and changed people he must get used to. It's easier to be sent behind the bars, but he has to try. After all, Samanoski finds Guildenstern and Jacques's loved ones somewhere in the basement of something like a morgue. Although the process of mutation has already started, there is nothing to worry about as it feels that the blood sand glass is scripted and the couple will be fine anyway. Even if I take too much time. The battle is simple. You had to collect as many arrows as you could to practice bow shooting. 
primitive technologies come in handy against the developed scientist. Thanks, it's auto aim, pure pleasure. And Tai take the victory from his cold dead hands, a long waited retaliation for his dumb laughter. Apparently, Michelle and Henri celebrate the second birthday. At least it looks like that. On the wall, they see a picture of the castle, Mont Saint Michel, where Jacques is transported to. So that's their next stop. Akko can't stand this awkwardness anymore and decides to see Jacques. When she jumps back, he's still vibing on the train. She asks him to give something from his ex-wife, and he hands over a ring. She thanks him and teleports to the future. Then she claims that she can let Henri speak with his mother. By doing so, the boy has a chance to say last goodbye while his mother is asking to be happy and live his own life. That's what would really make her happy. Henri takes weight of his shoulders and finally becomes a little joyful and optimistic as a child should be. They shed a tear and finally get to the castle. It's huge and malicious. Can you see the lightning like in the best tales about evil wizards? Ooh. At the same time, Jacques arrives at the end station. He sees Mr. Honda who is challenging Jacques for no reason. But another demon is looking at them from above. Her name is Vega Donna. She is a demon queen and a spouse of Nobunaga Oda. She commands Hihachira to dispose of the western barbarian. But he doesn't feel like taking orders and walks away again. She cannot believe her eyes and tells him off, but doesn't attack Jacques and runs after Hihachira. Not so brave when there is no man's back to hide behind. Women. <laughs> That scene erases all the seriousness, because what kind of order is in the Genma ranks if a mere human doesn't take it and does what he wants? Also, Capcom repeats itself again. It was the same sequence in the first game, when an insect woman appeared from nowhere playing a big deal. At least this one has less clothes. Cannot wait to see the next insect woman in the fourth game. First of all, this fortress holds many secrets and puzzles. Second, it's used for improving the time machine at any cost. For instance, exploiting slaves, driving them to graves. But the place has been chosen for a reason. The time machine needs stable sorts of energy. So to power it up, they absorb the limitless energy from the sky. And as it's in the open area and it's quite high, it is the best location. Jacques releases the slaves to save them. Later, Heihachira comes to help him and gives away a key to the main section. Inside the building, he gets into a trap. The gas fills the room and Jacques is being asphyxiated by it. Henri feels the grave danger again and Michelle agrees to escort him to find Samanoski. She finds a grenade launcher that makes her invulnerable. Aka says to the group where Jacques is and they run over there. There is one way to stop the gas and Henri unlocks the keypad to operate the room. But they are in the future. So jumping in time would take too much time. So Henri finds the solution. He established a mental conjunction with his father. Here comes the most challenging puzzle I've tried so far. It requires a decent short-term memory, which I, as a matter of fact, don't have. While playing as Jacques, you have to mirror the sequence of buttons which Henri is pushing. And every stage, the combination is getting longer. So you need to remember a previous code and keep in mind a new one. It took me a dozen of tries and to be honest, I. I haven't thought that this game would surprise me and show that I need to work on my memory for sure. After all, Jacques is fine. Samanoski, Michelle and Henri come back to the main hall. And the screen that was off before is now operating. Mori has changed his occupation to a weather forecaster. He is broadcasting that soon it will be cloudy with a chance of the Genma fall around the Eiffel Tower. The engine in Mont Saint Michel is working at full performance to power up the time machine built into the Eiffel Tower. Now the process of time traveling of Nobunaga Oda and his army has begun. The trio is running away because the machine breaks down under the pressure. They go back to the entrance, which is guarded by the Hellhound. Well, it was a piece of croissant for Jacques, but it is a big deal for Samanoski, so it gives me pain in the ass. While fighting, Michelle was hurt, and when the battle is over, Henri, feeling guilt for misbehavior towards Michelle, claims that he will be happy to become a stepson and that Jacques will have a such a wonderful wife. While they are driving away from the explosion to Paris, Aka jumps back to Jacques to tell good news. The most complicated the task is over. His son accepted Michelle and now they have a little left to do. Stop Nobunaga the third time. Aka joins Jacques and they go to the next location, as this trap was a dead end. In another room, Vegadon is about to launch a huge Genma Leviathan to the sky and erase Mont Saint Michel out of existence. Jacques' whip saves him again and he hides inside the creature. You might think that destruction of this fortress would mess up all plans because it wouldn't exist in the future. Well, it makes sense 
hands. But there is also a paradox called the grandfather paradox. To make a long story short, if you travel back in time and put down your grandfather, it wouldn't let you be born. But if you did annihilate your grandfather, it means the present hasn't been changed because you could do such a crime and stay alive. So it means you can do anything in the past and it won't change anything in your present but probably create another universe. So Vegadonna destroyed this fortress in the past and probably ruined all plans of Nobunaga Oda in another universe. <laughs> Sometime later, the Leviathan moves its leg and sleeping Jack can't manage it and falls down. He is lucky because Samanos and now friendly Hihachiro were pacing by. Aka called them and they made a bonfire to get Jack thoroughly warm. Hihachiro begs for forgiveness. He was made to ally with the Genma because of his lord who joined the Genma troops. Therefore, keeping his loyalty used to be in first place. They make up a witty plan to attack Azuchi castle where Nobunaga must be now, but is heavily defended and they need extra extraordinary support. And there is only one way, it's to awake the Oni army, which might be a key to the victory. Hihachira goes to the Azuchi castle because they need an inside man when the invasion starts. Samanosuke and Jack move on to the Oni orb to activate the army. Stay here and control the Oni. Go, Jacques! Got it! I would say it looks like Samurai Warriors on a low budget again. Anyway, it's so juicy to get tons of souls out of nothing because the Genma zombies die every second. Hihachiro opens the gates to Azuchi Castle and inside, of course, they encounter Brad Team Mori. Mr. Honda wants to take care of him on his own. I don't mind. Mori had been humiliated so many times, he cannot fall down any lower. Jacques enters Nabonaga's private room and there is only Vega Donna. She is saying something before the battle, but I don't think Jacques cares. Oh. Even though she doesn't play a big role, I wish we could fight her before because it's really exciting and makes you read her moves and study it. She easily avoids attacks and strikes together with her doppelganger. I feel like a baby who hasn't learned anything throughout the game. But after all, she dies and only presence of Nabonaga is his arm that remains in this room. Jacques goes upstairs and he finds dying Hihichira. He was trapped by Mori and lost the fight. The boy again acted as a decoy and it worked out this time. Hihachira is dying not like a Ronin who abandoned his master, but like a human who wanted to protect his kind. It's sad and all that, yet I still think he doesn't make any difference to the storyline. Even like a boss, he was just a punch back. The only time he made some difference is when he opened the gates. But look, Jacques has a whip, he could just jump over the walls using it and then open it too. Before he dies, he says that Nobunaga is in Hanoji temple. But goddamn, Samanosuke from the future could tell Aka the same intel. They would save Hihachira and try to change tides of the battle with the Oni army which would attack Hanoji temple, getting an advantage. But everything happened as it happened. In the future, the trio turn up to the Eiffel Tower. It's tentacled. Is there a word like that? I'm sure there is. So it's very tedious way to the viewpoint with crowds of monsters and it makes you wonder, was it worth spending time for that? But in the game there are veins all over the tower and time anomalies that send you back in time if you are unlucky to get stuck in them. On the viewpoint there is mutated Mori waiting for his 5 minutes of fame. He's adjusted the time machine and is ready to die for it, protecting his lord's plan. His skills got better, he almost gets me but I have a few pills to take and flip the script. His sacrifice made it possible to activate the time machine and start the process of teleportation. Now there is only one way to stop the demon lord fight him in the past. This time Samanoski is accompanied with Jacques. Together they come closer to the Lord's castle. Still human Mori is standing on their way, but peace was never an option, so Jacques attacks first and throws several punches. Then they enter Nabunaga's room. He seems to be annoyed to fight Oni children again and again. First it was Jubei Yagyu, now Samanoski and this French policeman. Nabunaga casts spells and knocks Jacques off his feet for a while. Samanoski attacks next. He is trying his best, yet it's obvious that 
the samurai doesn't stand a chance and little by little loses the battle by being knocked out. Don't worry, it seems that this fire is just a decoration and won't hurt anybody. Jacques gets a try to revenge and stop the Genma invasion. I spam magic abilities of all weapons and quite fast win the battle. Nobunaga falls down straight like a log. It's finally over, so Jacques rushes to Samanoski to see if he is alive. By sheer luck, he's fine. Jacques starts glowing bright, meaning that he is going back in his time. They shake hands, wish all the best, and the gendarme stands to the center of the room to be teleported alone without somebody else's hands or limbs. Suddenly, Nobunaga turns back like nothing happened and shoots his projectile to Samanoski again. He is definitely weak to this kind of magic. He cannot stand up, so Nobunaga comes closer, raises his sword and makes a big hole in Samanoski's chest. Jacques cannot do anything as the teleportation has already started, and he cannot move. The only thing he can do is to watch as his companion is breathing his last breath. A second later, he finds himself back in his time and his family standing behind. He is finally home, but the war is not over yet. He tells everything he saw to future Samanoski and wants to go back with him to stop this massacre. Of course, nobody is happy to hear that, and the samurai stops him because the time fold would be twisted. Well, everybody is a scientist now. The process of traveling to the past is starting, and he stands away and says his last goodbye to new distant friends. The new family goes home to have a well-deserved rest. I don't wanna be a party pooper, but look, the invasion is not stopped yet, there are monsters everywhere. Speak of the devil, and the devil appears. A glowing blade shows up behind a tree, it's Mori who doesn't want to give up. He runs after Jacques and his family and stabs Henry's back. No small boy can survive such a blow, so he's passing away on his father's hands. Jacques got sick and tired of Mori and beats him to manure. Holding Henry, Jacques feels the lightness on his right hand. It's the only gauntlet which heals wounds of Henri and is disappearing. After all the sufferings, the family can celebrate Henri's third birthday in relative peace. Unless Samanoski, who is in his time, loses the battle. Past Samanoski is much of a help, even being written off from history. His gauntlet is a strong weapon which is absorbed by future Samanoski. It turns him to the Nimusha and lets him be on an equal footing with Nobunaga. After a few hits, Nobunaga falls dead. Not yet. He stands back like in Matrix and they both end up being in another dimension or inside their minds like it was in the second game. There Nobunaga takes his full demonic form and becomes a mighty opponent. I waste all my medicine from the future and later land a fatal blow. Both of them wake up back in Nobunaga's private room. The demon lord says that the life of a man is just a wing in the life of the cosmos. And it seems he is happy to become a huge part of Japanese history. He loses his power and the black aura is covering him. Nobunaga knows where it all goes, because Samanoski had found a scroll that lets the gauntlet consume dark magic and seal it inside. Nobunaga doesn't fight back and accepts his fate. It happened almost like in a real life, but without magic, I suppose. In real life, Nobunaga Oda and Ranmaru Mori set Hanoji Temple on fire because they were outnumbered by Akechi Mitsuhide, another senior retainer of Nobunaga. It's unclear precisely why Mitsuhide betrayed his lord, though. Nobunaga and Mori then committed seppuku, so nobody would collect Oda Nobunaga's body. And indeed, his body was never found, so maybe he escaped. Or, okay, magic took place, and his body was absorbed by the magic gauntlet of the Oni Warrior. So he's still alive somewhere there, hiding, creating his new plans. You never know. Samanoski goes to a river to drink some water. Taking it, he remembers about Nobunaga, who is sealed inside the Oni artifact. He has another mission to keep the Demon Lord in prison for as long as possible. There is another true ending connected with Akka, which I told about at the start. I would have got it if I had collected all dresses for her. Forever and ever. What do you say to that? I say, do as you please. Hmm, that's no answer. Do you want me to stay with you or not? I don't know. The thought never crossed my mind. Take a good look, Samanosuke. 
I'm as much of a woman as the next girl. And I fell in love, too. I can see that. Now all you need is a boyfriend. Okay, it's cute, but she's still a girl. Later, there is a final beat about Takichiro Kinoshita, who is leading the army to the west. His beloved lord is out of the game, and he starts his life with a clean shit. Not only taking command of Nobunaga's army and changing his name to Hideyoshi Toyotomi, but inheriting demon powers as well. And the last game in the Nimusha series, called Dawn of Dreams, will be somewhere in time. Stay tuned for more content. If you enjoyed the video, give a like, subscribe and tell your closest ones how much you love them. All the best and see you soon.